Okay, so we go back to the last thing that I was saying last time. So okay, continue. So I was discuss discussing this um, property that the merge operation on workspaces should be Markovian. So it should uh, at least have this property of you know, being like a, a, a memory less process, but more precisely, it can be formulated as the statement that it is a Markov chain in Hopf algebras in, in a sense that uh, I was describing last time. So, you know, coming, let me get to the, the point. Yes, so it's kind of, uh, in general, the uh, Hopf algebra Markov chains that uh, have been studied in the, in the literature on Hopf algebras are linear operators on the underlying vector space of the Hopf algebra that are built out of a combination of co-product and product with some linear operator in between, which most of the time is some some kind of projection, but it could in principle be some something slightly different, like the case that we're looking at. And you no, know, the main cases that have been studied are this kind of uh, you know, uh, composition of co-product and product, or iterated co-product and iterated product that have to do with, with shuffle operations, or these descent operators that uh, have in between the projection of one of the homogeneous subspaces of the of the image of the co-product. So, in uh, you know, so the, as I said, two slightly stronger or slightly weaker form of what it means for such an operation to be a Markov chain, and you know, the the stronger one is that there's a global rescaling and a rescaling of the basis of the uh, the combinatorial of algebra for which the resulting operator has a, a Perron Frobenius eigenfunction with eigenvalue one. And uh, the slightly weaker form is where your rescaling is also local on the operator. So, so how we see this kind of property in the setting that we are looking at. So, you know, the, what we are looking at is the procedure of forming structure some form in you know, some sentence, you no know, starting with a bunch of un unrelated you know, lexical items, not and then building gradually them into structures using the iterations of the of these merge operations. So let's start with a given multi-set of uh, lexical items and syntactic features, meaning that of course, some of them could be repeated. They play play different roles in a, in a circle. You can have the same lexical item play different words, different roles in the sentence. And uh, so we we start with the forest, which is just made of uh, single leaves with with a label. And then you know we you can take the the vector space in the in in the vector space found by all the forests in which consists of those that have the same set of decorated leaves. So you have sort of fixed the number of lexical items involved and you look at all the possible structures that are built on those. And I further wanna restrict this subspace by only considering those where some structure has already started to be built, namely the set of edges is non-empty. Non and the reason why I want to do this is because, okay, I'm looking at the process of, of building structures, but also in order to, so that the, the Markov pro property is going to come out of this Perron Frobenius property. And for that, I want to have the, this kind of, uh, you know, um, strong connectivity of the underlying graph of these, of these actions. And and for that I you know I'm gonna expect that every every vertex in this graph has to be reachable from something. But you know, there's no so, you know, there's no operation that will give you back no structure at all from from one where you start with structure because you are even if you are extracting, well, you're always extracting things that, that have that structure. Okay, I mean this this of course likely depends on which quotient you're taking in the co-product. So you know as you can have if I if you do this quotient where you delete you no know, you you just take the the maximal binary sub three that uh, you no know, you could 
end up with the cases like I, I don't know, mentioned, where you have an, a, an admissible cut, for example, the cut two edges underneath the root, and then you have just an empty uh, on one side, and then you have just a bunch of lexical items. So if you take that coproduct, then you don't need to make this restriction, but because that would be reachable from an operation that you do on a structure that's already formed. But if you want the coproduct that maintain the trace of the, the structure that you are cutting off, then you, in order to have everything reachable, you need to make this restriction. So this is just like a technical issue that depends on a slightly different forms of the of the coproduct. But anyway, this this you know, subspace is is invariant under the merge operations. Is all merge operations construct more structures, so we will we will. Work. Uh, mother space itself so and, and maintain the same leaves so that that's an important part um so also you know because we are looking at all all of the possible operations that you can do on a given workspace right? so it means just like you could you think of this as being some kind of dynamics on the on the space of your workspace, you know, whenever you can apply one of these transformations, you do it. So we're trying to look at what the properties of the dynamics is. So you can as well consider, you know, instead of a single operation where you look for those particular matching terms, you can look at all the possible operations that you can apply. Of course, if I write it like this, this is an infinite sum. On the other hand, when you hit a particular workspace, it is necessarily going to be a finite sum because all the terms that will not appear anywhere in the workspace will go to zero. So I can just consider this operation that just performs any operation, any merge operation that can be performed on a given on a given workspace. And so the the kind of, of so what is this operation? You know, if I write it out explicitly, as as I did for for these ones, right? So if I if each of these operations is taking the coproduct, looking for matching terms, you know, merging those matching terms, and taking the product again to recompose the workspace, then I put all of these together. I'm simply projecting onto those terms in the coproduct that have only a, a two components forests in the left channel of the coproduct. So this would just, without this term, this would just be one of these type of uh, Hopf algebra marker chains that have a projection, some kind of projection in between the, the coproduct and the product. But I do one more operation. No, wait, if I, I'm, I now have all of these terms that, uh, that have only two components in the left, channel of the coproduct and I'm merging these two components together. So this is the other operation that happens in between this. Okay, so the and also right, because maybe that if I want the the internal merge is written as this composition of two of these merge with the empty set that just moves something from the left to the right side of the coproduct and then one of these external merges. If I want to include everything, I, I can also consider just this part, which is projecting onto the part that only has one, one tree in the in the left side of the product, and that will take care of, of including also all the internal merges. So I, I can consider these these two operations, either this one or this composite one that account for all the the ones. And so what about now this uh, irreducibility of strong connectedness property, which is what you need in order to be able to use Peron Frobenius. So we could look, so we have a, a specified basis here, you know, this combinatorial of algebra come with a preferential basis, which here is the, the set of forests. So if I take, I, I wanna look at the matrix representation of this operation in, in this particular basis and, <clears throat> And I want to you know, see that there is uh, some you know, uh, term. So first of all, okay, these are no, no negative terms and this uh, we are by construction because you know, it goes to a sum of terms you know, that, uh, you know, that, that are of, the, of, this, of, of this form. So it uh, it's, uh, has no negative coefficients, but you want to make sure that there's always at least one that is strictly positive to, to begin with. Uh, you know, and so that you know that uh, you, know, you can you can have at least one one edge that goes somewhere. And uh, so if you take let's 
to do this. Okay, let's take two verses. Let's just assume for simplicity that they are that that they are connected, that they are trees. You know, if the case for for forest is similar, because you just need to show that for one of the components you have a, you have a non a non zero coefficient. <clears throat> so you take the state to the case where they are two trees, and and I want to show that there's a there's a path in this graph between them. So what this means is that I want to know that there is a chain of operations that you know disassemble the first tree and reassemble it to give the other one. Mm -hmm. I mean these two trees have the same set of leaves, so they, that that doesn't change because they are in this subspace where I've already fixed what the set of leaves is, but they have different trees. They, so it's it's like different parsing structures for the same of the same set of uh, lexical items. And I want to make sure that I that can go through a series of these merge operations, some of which will disassemble the first three, and the other, the other will assemble the other one. So, so I can do that in steps. Right? So I start with the three that I'm, that I'm trying to disassemble. And I look at, uh, you know, I, I can make a list in whatever way I want of the, of the leads of this tree and start to look at them. And I want to locate pairs that are cherries in the other tree. Okay. And, and then, you know, I can, I'm going to have in a, a, a term in the coproduct that is going to look like this and that I can use for a successive merge operation that will produce the cherry that I have in the other tree. And of course, it could be that, you know, I don't have that when I say located one of the cherries, I don't have just that in the other tree. I have like the whole part of already of another structure that's all goes as it is to the other tree, then you know, you, you keep applying this operation. And, but so basically you, you have, you can do this in steps and the uh, thing that you can observe, like you can keep looking for pairs of, of higher structures you know, that occur in the first three and that will be merged as such in the other three. And then you have you have to you know, do a dis disassembling operation that cuts these structures and, and merges them together into, into the other three. So the, the interesting thing here is that you know, like, Last time I did a bit of discussion on the fact that you have these various forms of merge combined in this operation, this external and internal merge, but you also have this sideward merge where you are merging components that are extracted, for example, from different different I mean, sub accessible terms, substructures that are extracted from different components. And I said, okay, for for linguistic reasons, these operations are you know, not, uh, you know, you know, they don't give you know, results that, I mean, they give results that you don't want to have. And, and so they're considered like uh, error terms of, of, of lower, lower order with respect to the dominant you know, internal and external merge. And of course, one can, at that point, ask the question, right? Why, why do you want to do that? I mean, why do you want to have this big operation that contains all these terms and then filter out the ones that you don't want. Why don't you just define to begin with only the ones that you want? Right? In fact, in the older versions of uh, minimalism, they, that's what people were doing. You know, they you would have just a separate definition of external and internal merge. Don't try to make them you know, part of the same operation and then you don't have to deal with these other additional ones that come along. But it turns out that these additional ones, you know, they are subdominant with respect to structure formation, but they, they play a role. And they play a role here because they actually are necessary to get this kind of a strong connected uh, property of this action of, uh, of merge on the set of workspaces. Because you would not be able to have these paths between any vertices if you were not able to disassemble one structure and reassemble it into the other one. And so the, the the thing is that if you you get the strong Markovian property for merge exactly because you also have these other terms. Yeah, well, of course you, you could they could be you know, very subdominant with respect to these weights that, that I that I mentioned, but the point is that even if these edges you know that that represent that come from these operations are have a much you know, smaller weight than other edges, they're still there. So they're still for this property, you know, okay. 
And if you don't have uh, this additional uh, type of a sideward merge operation, and you only have the external and internal merge, you would only have this weaker form of the Markovian property that I, that I explained, and uh, you would not have like the, the, stronger, the stronger form. And if you only had external merge, you wouldn't even have that because you wouldn't be able to change in, in any way structures that are already formed. And okay, so you know this this no, just uh, do this part. So you know the, this Markovian property is uh, closely related to this, this structure and and these various forms. The the interplay between these various forms of uh, of merge. And okay, so uh, here's uh, something else about you know various uh, proposed extensions of uh, of the merge. Operation that one you know, finds discussed in the in the linguistic literature. So th there is something that is that is called countercyclic movements or late merge in uh, in linguistics, and it it is proposed as a way to justify the fact that in in certain languages and a certain you know, so, the, so the, there's a certain amount of empirical evidence from from various languages that there are situations where you have a piece of a sentence that is there, but it kind of behaves with respect to movement as if it, it wasn't there. And so you know, the, the, the suggestion of how to account for this kind of phenomenon is this idea of late merge that some of this structure is not there, is actually not there and is merged at the end, but then you know, it, you, your merge operation normally attaches things together at the root. But now you have something that is, so you, you do this bottom-up formation where you start with smaller structures and then you keep merging them together into larger structure, but you always merge at the root. While if you want to account for this idea that something is, is merged at a later stage, then you have to go and merge into something that's already formed at some you know, inner, in, you know, lower vertex. So in... The question, you no, know, of course, is is uh, who ordered this? <laughs> so it's like, you no, know, uh, is this is this truly something that's necessary? Is this an extension that is uh, something new in addition to the the structure that you already have at this point, or is it something that you already have but is somehow implicitly packaged with the the the, the rest of the structure that you already have? Okay. So what, what accounts for this kind of algebraic operations on trees in the, the structure that we have described so far? So the answer is that it is something that is already there. And so it's not, it's not really an extension of the, the merge structure that we have already described. It's something that was already you know, part of the structure. I'm going to show in a moment how. And this in particular, the fact that it's already part of the structure suggests that Things that are described in this form, they might, they, they should in principle have an equivalent, but maybe not immediately have in the description in terms of the structure that we already have described so far. And in fact, you know, they, well, well, you know I was working on this stuff, you know, I you know, checked with, with various linguists, you know, and, uh, you know, Augustin had, had went through a lot of examples in the literature in which this late merge is used. And according to him, in all of these examples, you could find another derivation that only uses the internal and external merge that we have seen so far. So it seems that, you know, the, the algebraic argument, which I'm going to explain in a moment for why this is already part of the package that you have, does seem to correspond to something that you can see also from the, the linguistic side, that it should be something that you already have. So what it, what in, from the from the purely algebraic perspective, you know, in terms of these type of, of algebra structures, what what is this operation? So, could you say you can show algebraic events uh, following? Uh, yeah, so that's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm going to tell you how it's related to the Hopf algebra of, of, of trees that I described a moment ago. So the the key structure for this is actually a Lie algebra structure. So, I mean, a Lie algebra uh, is, is a vector space and it has a bilinear bracket, which is anti-symmetric and satisfies the Jacobi identity, right? The, the you know, tangent space of a, of a Lie group at the identity is, is such a thing. And very often, you know, a, 
a nice way of identifying the algebra structures is in terms of some preliminary kind of structure, which is called a pre Lie algebra, and which is either right or left pre Lie algebra. And, and this is, again, a you know, bilinear map, which has this property that you know, this, this kind of a lack of uh, associativity of this. It, so there's a kind of sim symmetric kind of lack of associativity property that is satisfies. Okay. And, and the thing is that this, this identity reflects the fact that if you anti-symmetrize this operation, you get the Lie bracket. So this, this is what becomes the Jacobi identity when you anti-symmetrize it. It's like half of the Jacobi identity seen as a kind of lack of associativity me measurement. Okay. So, and so this is a, just a general fact about, about Lie algebra that, that very often the Lie algebra structure is coming from one of these pre Lie underlying pre Lie structure. Now, what is the connection of this kind of thing with, uh, with Hopf algebra? So it turns out that if you are in this case of graded connected Hopf algebras, there is an associated Lie algebra for these, which is the primitive elements in the dual Hopf algebra. And I'll, I'll say more in a, in a moment. I'll give you a precise statement of that in a moment. But let me let me first see, say something about what this uh, pre what pre Lie structure I'm looking at in the specific case of trees. Okay. So what is this pre Lie structure in the case of trees? Is exactly these insertions at inner vertices of the tree. So you define the pre, if you have two, I give you two trees, you define this pre Lie operation between these two trees. So it's exactly the node like this to suggest that you are inserting one tree into the other in all possible ways in which you can do that. So you look at all the, so here, here's your, your operation, right? It's a, well, the, the operation is exactly the one that I was drawing here. So you locate an edge. So this is the thing you're inserting, right? This is the thing you're inserting it into. So you locate an edge here. You bisect this edge with a vertex, and you attach the a new edge with the other one hanging from that new vertex. And you do that in all the possible ways by going over all the edges of this of this tree. Okay. So, and you no, know, the the identity that this this half uh, half uh, Jacobi identity or this this kind of uh, lack of uh, associativity. Well, I mean, let, let, let's look at for a moment again of what this identity is saying, right? So it's saying that I suppose, so here I have the three different trees and I'm inserting the second one into the first and then I'm inserting the third into whatever I get. So when I insert the third, there's two things that I can happen. Right? I can insert it directly into here. I can insert it directly into one of the edges of this or I can insert it in the new edge that I've created in order to insert this here. Okay, these are all the possible insertions. And here I'm, I'm subtracting the ones where I inserted the, this, this third tree directly into the second one. And, and I'm arguing that this is the same as you know, doing this in, in, in this order. So you know, inserting well, so if, if L3 is not inserted in L2, right? So these are what remains. If L, where L3 is not inserted in L2, then it's either inserted in L1, right? Or it's it's inserted, you know, it, it, it was like you know, something where, you know, so yes, the, here it's either inserted in L1, but then, you know, you don't want L2 to be itself inserted in L3 if you were counting these ones. So you have to subtract this other term. Okay, so sort of, well, I mean, the, the picture is sort of this one. Okay. I am, <clears throat> I'm inserting T2 into T1, and then I'm inserting T3, and I add and insert it, you know, I can insert it, you know, well, either separately into word T1 or T2, where 
or I can insert it in, in between, and then it's either on one side or the other of where the previous insertion was, or it is on the same side where the previous insertion was. And if you insert you know, T3 into T1 and then T2, you see that you get the same term. So this, this tells you that these two sides of the identity match. Okay. So this insertion of trees at internal internal nodes, you know, of the uh, actually internal edges you know, of the of the tree is indeed uh, a, a pre a Lie algebra, and so it defines a Lie algebra structure on the space of trees. And so, what? How is that related to the the Hopf algebra of trees? So this is the, the more precise statement of what I said a moment ago, that if you have a graded connected Hopf algebra, it is actually related to a Lie algebra. So one, you know, I, one thing I said before is that a, a commutative, so this is you know, graded connected and commutative Hopf algebra. So one thing that I discussed before is the fact that a commutative Hopf algebra is really dual to a group or you know, an affine group scheme, which is the, the homomorphism of, well, of algebras from that to some other algebra. But you know that group scheme, you can think of it as having an associated Lie algebra. And, and so this Lie algebra is actually the Lie algebra of that group scheme, the Lie algebra scheme. So a more concrete way of seeing this is, is, uh, is that you know, your Hopf algebra has a dual Hopf algebra where, you know, so you, you're taking linear functionals from H to the field. And so the product in H now becomes a coproduct by duality on the functionals. And the coproduct in H becomes a product on the functionals. So product and coproduct are, are exchanged in, the, in this dual Hopf algebra. So, the, the one you start with was commutative. This dual one is co-commutative, in general, non-commutative. Non and so if your initial of algebra had a basis, which was given by the forests, you can assign to that a dual basis, with, on the, which is just the, the, the delta function on a particular basis element. And you know, the, what are the primitive elements in the dual of algebra? So those are the ones for which the coproduct is primitive, which means the other the coproduct is the product in the original algebra. So they are the ones that are not decomposable in the product. So they are the trees in this case, the, the ones that are not products of anything else. So the the primitive elements in the dual of algebra are the trees. And what is this the algebra structure? Well, it's uh, it's you know as I said, this is the the linearization of the the affine group scheme dual to the Hopf algebra. So it you know, the the product in the affine group scheme is the one that's induced by the coproduct. So the the Lie algebra structure, which would be like the the commutators with respect to this dual product, you know, becomes. Well, what you what you write is you you write the, this product as the coproduct in your original of algebra, antisymmetrized in this form. But now you're only looking at the primitive elements. So these are functions that are delta functions supported on some trees. So all the terms in the coproduct that contain forests disappear because these evaluate to zero on anything that's not a tree. And what remains on the tree is exactly the insertions of, of subtrees, because those are the ones that you can extract with the coproduct. Okay, so, so this is the, 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 the sense in which these operations of inserting at uh, inner parts of the tree is really already accounted for by these this of algebra trees. It simply is this uh, dual, dual the algebra. So as I said, I mean this this seems to indicate that you know whatever people you know, suggest that you you need to introduce some kind of extension of merge that's based on this late merge of countercyclic movement, it should really be possible to obtain it already from the structure, just within the structure of algebra that you have, because this is part of the structure that you already have. 
So most of the examples where this, this kind of thing comes in have to do with you know, this, this kind of problems that I've already discussed elsewhere, which is the fact that in general, in, in linguistics, one does not have want to have co-indexing of uh, different terms that you have to keep track of in different phases of your structure or formation, because that sort of violates the fact that each operation should be memoryless if you have to keep track of indexing of different things as you as they move. And so, you know, the for example, you know, if you have a a sentence of the, like like this, you have moved the piece of the sentence from somewhere else, but you have to keep co-indexing you know, things in, uh, in in this to actually you know, keep track of what something refers to. And, and this you know, apparently violates some of these rules about you know, you know, co-indexing, which you know, are part of this uh, government and binding theory that, that precedes minimalism that I only mentioned briefly at the beginning, but I mean, the, the example is just to mention the fact that if one computes carefully, I mean, the, these co-indexing problems arise when you want to move something outside of, of phases, which I, I still have to discuss more, more precisely, and I'll come to that later. But as I mentioned, there are, there are like a substructures that in a sense, once they are formed, they become blocked for, for the movement. And so you don't want to have co-indexing that take things inside one of these phases and move them outside of the phase. But an example like this, it does not violate this property because from the point of view, which we shall explain later of how one counts these phases, this all counts as a single phase. So there's no coin. So it's perfectly constructed by internal and external merge without violating any, any rule. So one can go through a bunch of examples like this and that most, you know, it seems that the objections that, uh, the whole form at, at the fact that, that they are obtainable within this uh, this merge uh, formalism are in fact not uh, not so problematic. Okay, um, okay. So so far, you no. Know, the the kind of structures that I have discussed are uh, very you know freely formed you know, by whatever you, you obtain through you know, uh, this action of merge starting from you know, lexical items and, uh, and syntactic features. And of course, among these, you will find uh, structures that are not necessarily well parsable as, as sentences. So you need at some point to come to some more refined information to see that like, among all these, these freely formed structures, which ones are, are viable and, and which ones are not, and have some kind of filters that you know that make make some decisions about you know viability of of certain structures, and of course as I said some some of the decisions you know will have to become language dependent, but you already have some kind of uh, well formed property that are not language dependent that that you can formulate more generally. And so the first type of uh, structure that you can take into consideration that helps distinguishing between well-formed and not well-formed structures before you introduce dependence on particular languages is the concept of a head. And as I said, the idea of the syntactic head of a sentence is, is uh, in a sense simple. No, you think of uh, the elements that you are, you are combining together and usually there's one of them that is really crucial for this uh, ensemble to make sense. And without that, it would it would fall apart. Like, you know, the example, if you have a, an adjective combined with a noun, if you drop the adjective, the, it will still make sense. But if you drop the noun, it will just sort of be not, not formed, you know, in, in a way. Or, you know, if you have a transitive verb that, that expects a direct object, you know, and doesn't have it, you know, that there's something that's so. The, so the, the idea is to try to formalize the, the concept that, you know, structures that you form ever had to, when they are well formed. So one wants to define, you know, more, more precisely, what are the, the formal properties that the syntactic head of sentences usually has. And this is something that is pretty language independent because this, this property of, uh, you know, Having a head of sentences is not, uh, as far as it's known, not not a language dependent. I mean, where the, the head is located in a sentence is language dependent. Uh, when you when you put it out as a as a string of words, 
but the fact that structures do have a head is not language dependent. So the, the way that uh, one defines what can define what a head function is, you can view it as a as a uh, function from well here by internal vertices I mean the known leaf vertices of the tree to the leaves. So it means that every internal vertex, including the root, you map it to one of the leaves. Okay. And uh, with some rule of how you do that. And uh, the, the only rule that you require is that you know, if you have two accessible terms, so then each internal, each internal uh, vertex has its own accessible term, which is everything that's hanging below that vertex in the tree. So if two accessible terms are, you know, one of them is contained inside the other, then you know, if, if the, the head, the leaf that's associated to the, the vertex above is one of the leaves of the smaller tree, then it has to be the same as the, the leaf that's assigned to the vertex of the smaller tree. So like once the head enters into a subtree, then it has to be the same as the head of that subtree. Okay. And so, Okay, if if you have if you assign a leaf to internal vertices following just this this one particular rule, then you can see that you know this is the same thing as deciding when you are at the vertex. So you have you have two if, if it's not a leaf you you have two edges below that vertex. So basically, what you are doing you are deciding a marking on one of the two edges. Which is the direction in which the head goes, and so this, of course, if, if it's a planar tree, you could say you mark the left or the right, but it, it doesn't matter. You just mark one of the two edges. You can say, I don't know, you color the two edges uh, black and white. So below each vertex, you choose a coloring of the two edges, black and white. If you do that, then that defines a head because you can say I follow. Well, it defines in two possible ways, but you can say I follow all the all the white edges. And that, that takes me to one of the roots, and, and that's my map. And also, you know, if you do have a map like this, this, this property about subtrees is telling you that it really depends only on the coloring of the two of the two edges below a certain vertex, because then it's completely determined by the next step. And so you can indirectly show that it's, it's it's exactly the same as doing this coloring of the two edges below the vertex. So in particular, this tells you that there is a there is a total of two to the number of internal vertices or possible choices of a head function. Okay, I mean, of course, the one that you are explicitly interested in in linguistics has something to do with what are the the syntactic features associated to the leaves. For example, while it will select an, between a noun and an adjective, it will select a noun. You know some some rules like this that that depend on 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 the the specific choice of syntactic features at the at the leaves. But uh, a priori, you can call these abstract head functions. You know you and you you have a lot of possible choices of those. And the point is that most of the arguments that I'm going to do that uh, use the fact of having had actually makes sense for any any possible head function. You are only really using this property. And in particular, of course, it will hold for for the the head function constructed according to rules rules of, of the grammar. And so there's a if the first time that, that actually this uh, as far as, as I know, I don't know no the, the full the full literature, especially because someone writes a lot of papers. <laughs> But uh, the the first the first uh, time that you know I think this had function was defined was in this uh, structure paper in the nineties, and the, the definition there is slightly you know repackaged, but it's actually completely equivalent to the one that I described here, and uh, from from both the. Uh, the definition that I gave and and this so so this is saying okay how do you construct a head function well if you do, if you have a cherry tree it has to be one or the other leaf and you no know, if if you if you uh, go to larger structures you know, then in in a, in a sense so they yeah so there is this notion of maximal projection which is sort of hidden in this definition 
which is exactly following, like if you start with one of the leaves, you follow up to what point that is the head of something. Right? So for some structure that will, will not progress to anything because like the, the next thing that's attached to it is the cherry will be the head. So that stops there. The other one projects one step. Then you look at what is what is above that, right? And it either continues or or it goes the head goes the other way. So there's like a for each leaf there's like a maximally high you know or closest to the root, the vertex that closest to the root that is still that still has that leaf as the head, and that that's the, the maximal projection. Um, so the the head this is defined in terms of this of the head of structure defined in terms like are equivalent to assigning this kind of uh, maximal maximal projections. And but of course both from here and from from this the definition that I, that I gave before, it it's clear that no it's not always you you shouldn't expect that to be always the case that if I take two trees that have a well defined head function and I merge them together. Well, I mean, abstractly, of course, I can make a new head function by choosing either one of the other of the edges that I form. But if I want my head function to be determined by some properties of the of the lexical items at the leaves, it might not be possible to do this consistently when you do the next merge. Okay? Because, you know, for example, I could merge a copy, I could merge this one tree to itself, right? And and if I whatever algorithm I have used on the basis of my you no know, leaves and the properties of the leaves of, of this to decide where the head of this tree is, it's gonna also decide where the head of the other tree is. And then if I merge these two together, how am I of course the head is is going necessarily going to be either one or the other, but which one? I don't have a deterministic way of, of assigning that. So in general, no, there there would if I if I start a construction of a head function on the basis of properties of the leaves, there will be some domain in in the set of all syntactic objects that for which that way of constructing a head function will will work. And and this domain will not necessarily be. Uh, a sub magma of the of the magma of syntactic objects it would not necessarily be stable under under the the magma operation. So I mean this this is an example right here I, because I'm necessarily drawing the plane uh, the the tree as planar. I'm, I'm indicating the the head with an arrow that points in the direction, but you can just say that I'm, I'm marking one of the edges even if the the tree is not planar. And okay. so you know this. This head is the one that has the maximal projection and is the actual head of the entire tree. This one doesn't project anywhere, no, it doesn't, doesn't go anywhere, but this one projects up to here and no, this one projects up to, up to here. So that's uh, one example of how this head function works. But so the, the important thing is this that in general, you know, if I have a construction of a of a head function that, that is built out of you know starting from syntactic features associated to the leaves to do some you know rules about how these combine, then I I will you know end up with I will necessarily end up with some situation where I have two copies. I have two trees that you no know, will not that are in for which this head function is well defined, but for whose merge will not will not be even well defined. And these are called exocentric constructions in the in the linguistic literature. And so this already tells you that there is a class of structures that are freely formed by merge, but that are are not going to be possible. And and those are this is the first filter that you can have. Which is not language dependent is is dependent on on syntactic features that the, the notion of you know, parts of sentence is is common to languages. So it's a, it's a kind of filter which is happening before you know the the embodiment into into one particular language. So the the fact that uh, of course the fact that if I give you a head function. 
this is the same as marking the, the two edges or coloring the two different colors, the two edges below every internal vertex, is also telling me that a head function defines a planar structure on the tree. Because if I'm coloring all the edges either you know, black or white, now I can say I put all the, the black edges to the left and the, the white edges. So it actually determines two possible planarization that, you know, that so they like define consistently how to you know, order this, this, uh, these edges. So the, this was observed you know, several years ago by Richard Kane, and they called it linear correspondence axiom, which is like a, a sort of proposed this as a kind of canonical choice of planarization, canonical in the sense of language independent, choice of planarization of, uh, of all the, the syntactic objects. Of course, no, this, this is not uh, a planarization of all the syntactic objects for the reason that I just said, that you know, if, you, if you actually have tried to construct a head function that uh, reflects syntactic properties, there are necessarily going to be trees that are not in the domain, you know, syntactic objects are not in the domain of that head function. And so also, I mean, this, this of course, in this respect is necessarily going to be the case because you know, if you had like a universal way of choosing the place, it would be like saying that there is like a, a universal preferred word order in language, <clears throat> which I mean <laughs> is, uh, you know, I mean, it's, of course we, we know that word order is not uniformly, I mean, languages that have different kind of word order structures are not uniformly distributed among you know, languages. There are many more languages that have certain type of word order structure than others, but there's at least a few competing word orders that, that are very highly represented among, among human languages. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, it sounds a bit like there, there is this, this famous, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not a joke, it's an actual quote of uh, Diderot, who was uh, writing uh, that, uh, French is, is the one language that is really close to the way that the human mind thinks. <laughs> Which, <laughs> yes, maybe if you happen to be French. <laughs> so, so somehow, you know, this, this kind of claim about the universal way of establishing a word order for sense it sounds, sounds a little bit like that. But <clears throat> But okay, no, it's certainly it's true that you know head functions do define uh, you know, planar embeddings for for anything that is in the domain of that of that right. But so you know this uh, as I I'll come back to this you know in a moment because you know I'll start to talk about this externalization procedure, which is what you actually do embody your structures into an actual language. And there you do have to make a construction of planar embeddings because your sentences in the end are, are linearly ordered. But of course, that is going to be a language dependent construction. And you know, it's, uh, it, it is uh, not uh, no, necessarily non-canonical <laughs> so, but you know, for directly for, for algebraic reasons as, as I will say now. Okay, so there's this other thing that I mentioned a few times that uh, that I want to discuss. So we are still, you know, in the, in a stage which is uh, pre, uh, you know, specialization to particular languages, but there's a little bit more than just locating a head, uh, having a head function on your structures. There is also some this this fact that I mentioned that certain substructures are uh, you know, complete in a certain sense uh, once you pass to embed embed them into larger structures, and so the the idea is that your structures contain phases, and this means basically phases of of the of the full construction where you reach a, a stage where you have a self-standing structure that by itself could already be parsable you know, in terms of, uh, of semantics. So it, here's just you now I started picking an, an example, which is you know, more or less similar to the tree that I just that I just showed before. So one assumes that you, know, you, you have a bunch of leaves, so your construction you know, starts out with this uh, 
original set of lexical items as we know for the structure, you know, just, just trees, which are trivially disconnected leaves with their labels. And then, for example, let's suppose that this is the first structure that gets formed. And you know, here I have a, this substructure has a head, which is here. And, and now, I mean, the, the additional piece of information in addition to the head is the fact that what is not a head consists of, has two different possible roles. One is things that uh, mandatorily have to bind with the head. Again, something like, you know, if you have a transitive verb, it has to have a direct object for, for the sentence to be well formed. And you, know, and you cannot drop that, otherwise it's not a complete sentence, not a complete substructure. And, but there are other things that are modifiers, like you know, an adverb, an adjective, something that you know, even if you remove it, the, the sentence could still be you know, a complete self-standing sentence. So at each part of the construction, for example, you could have something like I'm calling Z, the, these uh, uh, parts of the structure that necessarily have to combine with the, with the head, they're called the complement of the head. And other stuff, which I'm calling them, are the modifiers, which you know, are something that you know, necessarily, not necessarily have to combine with things. Of course, these could contain substructures. So the the complement could be more than, than one. I mean, like uh, if you have a verb that calls for, for different different things, like you know, give something to someone, you know, there's there's more than one thing that necessarily have to bind with the structure. So there could be like more structure into what the what the complement looks like, but still there's a substructure that is the complement of the head that's not necessarily called for by the head. And there's other stuff that, that are modifiers. So you no, know, if whatever is uh, the the complement and modifiers of the complement of the head is usually called the interior of the phase. And Whatever is the head and possibly modifiers of the head is the, the edge of the face. And so if I'm building structure from the bottom up, well, I form a certain, a, a certain structure that has a head, a complement of some modifiers, and that in itself completes a, a certain, certain phase. And uh, I have you know, another, I start somewhere else, you know, if I, Think of these, these various merge operations that you're building structure. You now I start somewhere else and start forming another structure that's going to have inside complement modifiers, and and so on. And then you know, so each time I'm you know, adding a new phase, I'm doing one of these external merge operations that brings in something else from from the outside, and I can also at the same time have situation where I do. Uh, internal merges before you know, closing it off with something else of a merge and, and then you know, continue building. So the, the process of, of constructing in general looks, looks something like this. You, know, you have a top phase and you know, for each of them you have an interior and then you have stuff that's on the, on the edge of the phase and, and you have other you know, deeper phases which have their own interior and, and edge. And the, the idea of separating things out in, the, in this way by identifying these substructures that are stable uh, once they are constructed is that you, know, you uh, expect that you know, when you keep doing movement and modification to the setters, you don't extract any more from the interior of things that are already formed. So you can you can use while you are once you, while you are building your phases you can use the movement your internal merge to move things from the interior to the boundary of the phase. Once they are on the boundary of the phase, you can still still get them out you know at the next stage. But if they remain in the interior of the phase, then you know once you close it off with another phase, you don't get so it, you don't get to extract things from from there anymore. 
And, and this partly you know, serves the purpose of uh, containing the combinatorial explosion of extracting all the possible accessible terms once your structures start to become bigger. The point is that you don't need to do that because you, know, you will not be using you know, things that are already closed into some completed, completed phases. So if you want to take into account this, uh, this possible additional structure that has the complement of the head and the modifier, instead of just defining a head function as uh, mapping in, in an internal vertices of the tree to one of the leaf, you want to assign one a head function that identifies the leaf and its complement. So some the complement is uh, some subset of leaf or some some accessible term that's attached to the and and so. And the idea then is that okay, you have these, uh, you have some kind of algorithm, right? That so when when I show an example like this, it means that I I want to describe some kind of algorithm that why as I'm building the structure will identify the phases, and I can do it you know, like this. So if I have a a head function, well, because of this fact that the the head projects, right? I it means that. I am partitioning all the vertices in the tree into a disjoint union of paths, which are the projection of the head. So, you know, if I if I go back to to this example here, right? What I mean is this: that you know, the, all the all the vertices of the tree are on exactly one one of these paths. So, this one, the path consists has zero edges. Is that because it doesn't go anywhere? And this path is actually going all the way to the root. And this part is also just zero edges. And so is this one. And this one is one edge. And this is this one is two edges. And every every vertex is exactly on one on one of these parts from one of the of the leaves. So you can always you know a, a, a head function, you can also view it that way as a as a partitioning of the vertices in the, into a, a, a family of paths parameterized by the leaves. And, and now you know, the, each one of these paths determines a, a phase. The phase is the one that has that maximal projection. So it closes off once you reach the maximal projection of that, of that leaf. And you know, the, the it consists the phase that co corresponds to that consists of all these accessible terms that are you know inside of this inside of the of the of the, of the you know, subtree that's formed by by that maximal projection and the phase interior if you if you go to if you follow this this path and if you look at the um so, Next sister vertex under that, and and you take the the accessible terms that are below that, that gives you really where the the, the things that's commanded by. This is a way of rephrasing this C command relation that I mentioned a while back. So the things that are commanded by the head are are going to end up there, and uh, and the phase edge is is what is left in the phase that's not C command. So you have you know, this, this way of decomposing your structure into, into phases. And, and this have a, a partial ordering in the sense that you know, some phases are contained in higher phases. So you, know, you, you can you know, inductively build them as, as you build the, the structure. And so I, what I was saying that you consider certain terms, now certain accessible terms, so in the a priori, you know, all all the internal vertices of, of the tree give you an accessible term, but now some of them become inaccessible if they are locked inside one of the phases that that are already completed and that uh, lower phases than than what they are. And you no, know, as I as I was saying, the internal merge allows you to move things from the interior to the boundary of the phase as you're building the structure, and then the next phase is formed by external merge. So external merge forms phases, internal merge allow you to move things to the place where you they, they will still remain movable 
in, uh, in, in various steps. And this in particular means that you, you can, you know, if you restrict to those uh, forests where the trees do have a well-defined head, a particular well-defined combination of head and complement that well, makes it possible to define phases, then you can simplify your co-product by you know all in considering the phases themselves now as being primitive objects that no I mean the interiors of the phases to be primitive objects that no longer decompose. And and this you know significantly reduces the, the combinatorial problem of the of the co product. So this um yeah, maybe just mention it here that I, I'll, I'll mention it again uh, again later. You know, there's a there's a sense in which this uh, you know blocking access to the, the terms inside one of these completed phases and saying the interior of one of these completed phases is sort of similar. I mentioned this before, similar to what one does in physics models, where you block the spins in uh, they do this as block spin normalization, where you block a bunch of degrees of freedom and you consider them replaced by a single you know block variable that. And and in fact, I mean, there there has been I'll, I'll give you reference later. There's been some some uh, uh, couple of papers that try to look at merge as a kind of a tensor network type renormalization in, in as you build the structures bottom up. But one thing that I think they they don't take into account is that so they just look at like all of, all of the substructures that are cherries and then all the substructures that have one other thing. But I mean, this is this is not does not reflect the actual way that these uh, stru the structures are uh, have you know, co consistency, linguistic relevance in the sense that phases are the right type of substructures to consider if one wants to do that kind of model, not just all the substructures of a given depth. Well, uh, and, and there is a there is another thing that this uh, this construct this construction of a head. You no know, can do, which is the fact of giving you an algorithm for labeling the internal vertices of the tree. So in the in the previous you know, forms of uh, of minimalism and uh, government minded and you, know, you you do attach certain labels to the interior vertices of the tree. For example, something is a verb phrase, something is a noun phrase, and and so on. But uh, you know, ex exterior is you know, this categories X that you assign as labeling of the internal vertices of, of the trees. And in this form of uh, more most recent form of minimalism, the internal vertices of the trees are not labeled, so they're not something that you have to assign. You only assign the, the lexical item and syntactic features of the leaves. But the thing is that if your the syntactic object is parsable in the sense that it is in the domain of a head function, then it it, you also do have a way of doing the the labeling. So the basically what what you do is like you you follow these paths right that that uh, that are coming from the head, and you label all the internal vertices. Every internal vertex is is exactly on one of these paths. So there is an unambiguous labeling which is the head, and that all all, all the things that are on the same path of, of one of the leaves is labeled by that thing. And of course, it, again, if you want to say that, that this is a construction where you that goes with the structure building, then you are in the same with the same issue that you have with the head. I mean, if you're trying to construct a head function from data associated to the leaves, then you run into the, the possibility that when you're trying to combine two trees together by merging them, that the head function is not necessarily well defined. So how do you label you know, the root if, if you're trying to, to do a labeling of the known of all the, the other vertices? So the one of the things one can observe is that even in some cases where you know the you might not have that the merge of two trees is in the you know in the domain of the head function. You might be able to assign labeling if like one one of the of the so if one of the terms rises, which means that one of the internal merges that you can do by so you have two two sub trees, right? And and one of them is you have to decide whether the head goes one way or the other way. And a priori you don't have a good 
good way to make that decision. But you can move one or the other by internal merge. And in some cases, it happens that the structure that you obtain does have a head. And then that you know, will force your original one to have one. So there are cases where you can do a labeling, you know, even if the, the head itself does not, is not compatible with merge. But still, even with this uh, extension, this is this is called um, dy dynamical asymmetry. So, uh, you know, it was observed by uh, Mona that you, you can have labeling sometimes even when the head function does not combine on the merge. But uh, the even with this kind of extension of this labeling algorithm, is uh, it remains true that certain objects or certain syntactic objects cannot be labeled. And so again, this is a filter that uh, eliminates some of the structures, even if they are you know, not, uh, well, it's, it's a, even they're not yet embodied in one particular language. It's one uh, a priori language independent filter that eliminates some of the freely generated structures. Uh, right. So the, yeah, this is the observation that I made uh, made a moment ago that uh, you know the, there is there are similarities between the, this structure building operation of merge and and some of these uh, tensor network normalization models in physics and uh, the, some of there's, there's a couple of papers that have discussed that but uh, both of them are actually not I think doing it in the in the best way because yeah they. They don't do it according to phases, they just do it according to that. So this is like an obvious thing that, that one can easily do a better job with. <laughs> Sorry. Mm, I wanna just mention one more thing. So the I, I discussed a little bit uh, back why um, merge is binary and, and why you don't want uh, n-nary merge. So, uh, you no know, syntactic objects where the trees have, uh, have you know, valences n rather than n branching rather than two branching. However, there are situations where you might want to also account for certain structures that are, for example, what, what uh, linguists call uh, unbounded unstructured sequences. So these are things of this form, like you know, John Will and my friends, one Will, my friends, and the actor of uh, the Oscar friend dance to convocation, something like this. So this this doesn't have a, an obvious binary parsing, right? Because it's really just a kind of unstructured sequence that that is not you know uh, combined of substructures that naturally bind together in pairs. So. How do you well account for these kind of things? And so the, the suggestion is that you might occasionally want to consider consider operations that are nary, but not in the same sense as an nary merge. An nary merge really creates you know, an nary syntactic objects. Here you want to have a bunch of binary syntactic objects and and collect them together. Here it, it just happens that, that essentially all of this, but I mean some of these are themselves binary trees, right? So there is, you have a kind of collection of of, uh, of syntactic objects, but you want to say that those are collected together into, into a structure, which is one of these un, you know, unstructured, this is not further structures behind this collecting them together. And this, this is uh, something that in the, in the linguistic paper, this is often just called form sets, which is this kind of not further structure. And they, this also is used in some uh, in some other operations where you do have you no know, sentences in which you want to keep track of the fact that certain terms are actually not they, they really are copies of that. I mean they they are the same thing, not just you know. Of course, you can have a well. If I if I say a sentence like uh, I don't know, this is the example that. Uh, Many people see many people. Okay, this these too many people are not necessarily the same people, <laughs> but uh, but there are situations where you have the same lexical item occur occurring in a sense that you really want to mark as being the same, and and then you want to group together a bunch of terms that are not just necessarily in a binary form and mark them as being on a di on a diagonal inside your product of uh, objects. 
And this is again like a form set operation that is not in the binary. So you have these other operations there. And of course, these other operations just mean that you know you that you can always describe it in a similar form to the way that we are describing merge, except that you here you don't need to extract substructures from your the the uh, syntactic objects. These operations typically are not uh, are not if you know seeing the the substrat they are just grouping together a bunch of of of, uh, of uh, syntactic objects. They don't. They're not sensitive to the substructure of the syntactic objects. So you can think of them in a similar way as, as uh, the way we write the, the merge operation, except that you only use the primitive part of the coproduct because you, know, you, you don't need to extract substructures. You just need to pick a bunch of components, put them together in your left channel of the coproduct, which is where you can act with this, uh, this grafting operation. Which now is a kind of is, is going to be an NRE graph thing if you put put together n terms, and you can group those terms together and just marking them as being as being the same structure, part of the same structure, and then it just means that you no, know, for example, this this way that certain things are on the diagonal, when you perform movements and these things are identified, they all move at the same time. They don't they no longer move independently, and then this allows you to account for this kind of uh, this kind of phenomenon uh, for example if you if you have a, an example of this thing you know if you want to say long narrow dark hallway it really is a long hallway narrow hallway and a dark hallway except that this hallway is marked as being the same and then it can be, you know gets gets actually glued together as a single as a single structure Okay, so this, as I said, just fits by the same principle and the same kind of form of operation, right? So yeah, how do you algebraically um, um, denote when you want to not consider hallway? Yeah, that's right. So I, I will I will come back to discuss this this kind of example more explicitly, you know, and and uh, you know, I, I will, I'll give. So this this means that essentially you are. Um, yeah, restricting restricting to some diagonals in your space when you and and restrict the the operations of the product and so on only on that diagonal so that you know, all of this this term now move together so they really behave like a single term. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll give a little more details you now later. Okay, so the next thing that I so here is like so far some some basic you no. Know, uh, filters that you have on, on these three different structures that are so far language independent. But you know, now we have to come to uh, things that are actually dependent on languages. So I'm gonna come back to your question from a while back. You know, how do you, do you actually view, for example, these, uh, which I hadn't completely answered then, but uh, now, now we can do it. How do you, uh, Think again about this kind of cross serial dependencies that happen in languages like Dutch. So let's imagine this uh, this this situation, right? You you had a kind of you know, wild party last night, and you know you wake up this morning and you're speaking Dutch. I mean, it's that kind of party, right? And <laughs> so it happens, and <laughs> I mean, it could be worse. You could be waking up and speaking Swiss German, <laughs> which. No, that, 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 that doesn't go with parties. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you're speaking Dutch. So not just, so, so that, that's bad enough, but, but the, the, the only thing you remember about that party is this. So of course, well, you already know that, you know, if, when, a, when a hippopotamus shows up at your party, <laughs> things have gone way too far and the landlord is likely to complain. But but never mind. <laughs> you were speaking Dutch and there were hippopotami at your party <laughs> last night. And somebody was speeding them. But <laughs> because, because you're speaking Dutch, this is the way in which this happens. You know, it happens with, with a lot of cross cross serial mixing in your sentence, which might have a lot to do with what you drank at that party, but you know, it's still that's that's the way it goes. 
So here's this, this a bunch of things that that are happening, right? I mean, if if you if you were to say this uh, in a sober state, you were to say this sentence in English, it would sound something like this, right? And uh, you saw someone help someone feed the bus, but you know it's. The way it happens in Dutch is that all the nouns pile up first and all the verbs pile up next. And you know, it they are actually so all the subject and they're actually crossed right, this in this way. Plus, there's another curious crossing here, which is the fact that the direct object is also coming up in a, in a position that is not the place where you expect it. So there's a lot of strange movements. Well, strange, of course. Since Dutch is the language that most naturally reflects the way that the human mind thinks, you might think that this is you know, the, the most natural way to present the situation. But uh, you know, when you try to explain it to the landlord, but uh, you know, this uh, may be less uh, easy to explain how all this movement happened. Okay, so we have to explain. So let 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 just forget the, the exact words where, but uh, but let's start the sentence here. There there's there's a bunch of subjects that come in. There's a direct object, and then well there's some tense forms for the verbs. That's morphology, so we kind of you know, ignore it, and and we have we have three verbs that that are you know, uh, combined attached to the corresponding sentence and, and to the corresponding the subject and to the corresponding object. So. Well, if if I'm so let, let let's first look at this strange strange situation that the, the direct object has ended up here. Well, so one thing that, that we do know is that uh, languages that are more morphology, they tend to have slightly freer, freer kind of word order. And and Dutch does have cases like other Germanic languages like German, and uh, so the the fact that you can move the direct object has seemed you know, most likely more to do with morphology that allows you to kind of keep track of where something was actually supposed to be, you know, even though it's not exactly there, because the morphology tells you where it was supposed to be. And you know, this uh, the, the reason why we can say that this is maybe you know, explaining this more than something that's happening on, on the, at the level of, of a movement in syntax is because if I if I'm trying to realize this as movement in syntax, what I would do is so okay my my first uh, form form structure would have a verb that calls for a direct object that would be its uh, its interior of that phase, and it's combined with a subject okay and this closes closes up a, a phase. And and now I am, you know, externally merging this with the, this where I start the construction of the next phase and the starting the construction of the next phase. I have a verb that's that's calling for this this entire structure as as its own, you know, interior of the next phase. But now what I want to do at this stage is I want to do an, in, an in, internal merge that is taking this thing and placing it up here before I keep building the rest of the structure. And so I'm calling for a movement that's picking up something inside the interior of a lower phase. And so in principle, this is something that you know, is picking up degrees of freedom that I, that I have already frozen at that stage. And so this you know, is sort of suggesting that the explanation for this is really that this, this term is where it is, but you no, know, because you you're, you have the, the morphology of cases that allows you to remember what it's what it's attached to by by its uh, the, the, by its constraint structural constraints, you can you know still know where it is even if it's slightly misplaced in the in the sense. What about the this subject and verb movement? This this is a bit more more. Uh, Structural related than than the, the this one, so our if when we are building this structure just in this this really form sentence, we just look at the phases. What calls for what? Right? And when you when you form this this sentence, we you end up with a structure that's that's built in this way with these these various phases. But of course, the tree is non-planar, so 
it doesn't, you know, if I write it like this, I'm sort of suggesting something like the, the English word order, but but this this is not, uh, the word order is, is irrelevant. This is actually the same tree as this one, which is, you know, the same tree as this one. And, and then I can uh, do this uh, couple of you know, movements that uh, this verb, verb rising movements that move from the edge of the face and that uh, will reorder things in this form. And then I guess I get the cross serial dependence that, that I see in, uh, in Dutch. So, so this you know, uh, tells me that I, I get a, it now a choice of the planar structure that realizes that uh, that's cross serial dependence. So that, that's the answer to your question, right? Now I have a little more <laughs> details for, for doing that. You you are looking at planar embeddings now. Yeah. So now now in this one, I take this. Now I take this and I embed it in this way. Mm -hmm. And so once I embed it in the plane in this way, and I read off the order of things that I see at the at the leaves, I do get the order of the of the crossover dependence. So mm -hmm. this only embeddings only come for externalization. Right? Yeah, exactly. So that so this so this is so some of the, the example is suggesting two things, right? That you know your your externalization should take into account a choice of planar embedding, and it should also filter out certain structures, right? Because here, you know, I have the the possibility of deciding whether, for example, if I if I pick this this tree. And, and I plainly embed in, in this way, I get the, the word order structure for this same sentence in English. And if I make some movement on the, this tree and I, and I pick another planar embedding, I get the, the word orders of, of this sentence in Dutch. And so I have done two things in doing this. I have chosen a, a planar structure on the tree, and I've also done some movement and chosen one or the other form of this of, of, of this movement. So I'll, I'll you know, discuss this idea of uh, this model of externalization next time as a combination of this type of operation. So a, a choice of uh, planar embedding and choices of planar embeddings and filters that take quotients and, and the combination of, of these two operations. Yeah.